Howdy y'all, Gordon here, welcome to another edition of Southern Byways. Today, we're going south to Florida. Don't know about you, but um, if you've ever gotten off of the racetrack known as I-95 and slide over on Tay 1A to kind of relax, unwind a bit in your travels, like I had to do about six years ago, I had a bunch of business observations to do down in Florida. So I got off of 95, got on to A1A, and in just about every small town along the east coast of Florida, there's something named for Flagler. And that raises the question, who was Flagler? And what did he do to deserve this? And that's the subject of today's video. I just want to uh, mention one thing before I get into the video. A couple of things, actually. First, I'd like to thank my subscribers for tuning in. Please like. Please share this with your friends. Get them to subscribe and like it, too. It'll help the uh, numbers on the uh, YouTube algorithm. Uh, a lot of you don't know this, but I've had pretty bad arthritis in my right hip for a while. In the past, uh, three or four months or so, it's been about a 12 on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, yeah, it's been hurting like a son of a you-know-what. But... I've got a, I, you know, with the uh, heart medicines that I'm on and everything, I did not want to get an, on another pain pill uh, <coughs> or another medicine of any kind to try to leave the pain. So, I uh, did some research online. Discovered CBD oil. Uh, checked with work because, of course, with my line of work, I am subject to a drug test. And, uh, you know, they said CBD is fine uh, as long as the limit of THC is below the federal limit, which is 0.3. I checked, and uh, the CBD oil that I want, wanted to use is 0.3 maximum for THC. Next, I checked my cardiologist, and uh, her nurse called me back and said, you know, what's up? I told her about the arthritis and said, you know, my thoughts are I'd like to try a natural cure rather than you know, no pain pill or something like that. She said, what do you have in mind? I told her CBD. And I said, you know, researching one side effects is it can, it can cause a reduction in blood pressure. And so she told me the numbers to watch out for if my blood pressure gets below these numbers. I need to either reduce or stop using CBD, so I can do that. I checked with my general practitioner. She said, have at it. So I've started using it. Uh, the thing is, and you're going to notice it in this video, sometimes it's making my mind jump a bit wander, uh, I may pause, just trying to get my thoughts together, uh, it's like, this is my body, this is my mind, and getting a little bit about, 
bit out of alignment. Not all the time. Most of the time is fine and dandy. But once in a while, I get that little bit kind of out of sync. So, you know, it's, it's another thing I'm having to learn to live with. But I will manage, and things are going to work out fine. Anyhow, I just want to give that explanation so you understand why this video may be a little bit awkward, have some unusual gaps in it. Anyhow, again, thanks a lot for tuning in. Please like and share, ask your friends to subscribe to the channel, and uh, anyhow, let's get into finding out what Henry Flagler did that made so much of Florida decide to recognize him. So come on along for the ride. Henry Flagler was born January 2nd, 1830 in Hopewell, New York, about 30 miles east of Rochester. His father was a Presbyterian minister. His mother was the widowed Elizabeth Caldwell Morrison Harkness. He had two stepbrothers, which were his mother's son's Flagler attended local schools through the 8th grade. He dropped out of school when he was 14 and went to Ohio to go to work with his with one of his stepbrothers. His salary was $5 a month plus room and board. And he was involved in sales. No, he wasn't. He got promoted to sales, and his salary was increased to $40 a month. He then joined his stepbrother Daniel in the grain business, started with his uncle Lamont in Bellevue, Ohio. In 1862, Flagler and his brother-in-law, Barry Hamlin, York, founded the Flagler and York Salt Company a salt mining and production business in Saginaw, Michigan. He found that salt mining required more technical knowledge than he had and struggled in the industry during the Civil War. The company collapsed when the war undercut commercial demand for salt. Flagler returned to Bellevue having lost his initial $50,000 investment and an additional 50000 he had borrowed from his father-in-law and Daniel. Flagler believed that he'd learned a valuable lesson, invest in a business only after thorough investigation. After the failure of his salt business in Saginaw, Flagler returned to Bellevue in 1866 and re-entered the grain business as commission merchant with the Harkness Grain Company. During this time, he worked to pay back his stepbrother. Through this business, Flagler became associated with John D. Rockefeller, who worked as commission agent with Hewitt and Tuttle for the Harkness Grain Company. By the mid-1860s, Cleveland had become the center of the oil refining industry in America, and Rockefeller left the grain business to start his own oil refinery. Rockefeller worked in association with chemist and inventor Samuel Andrews. And Rockefeller needed capital for a new venture. He approached Flagler in 1867. Flagler's stepbrother, Stephen Harkness, invested 100000 on the condition that Flagler be made a partner. The Rockefeller, Andrews, and Flagler partnership was formed with Flagler in control of Harkness's interest. That eventually grew to become Standard Oil. 
It was Flanders IDT's to use the rebate system to strengthen the firm's position against competitors and their transporting enterprises alike. The rebates were equivalent to a 15% discount, and that put Standard Oil in position to significantly undercut the other oil refineries. By 1872, it was the leading American oil refinery, producing some 10,000 barrels of oil per day. In 1877, Flagler and his company moved to New York City. In 1885, Standard Oil moved its corporate headquarters to New York City to 26 Broadway. Cleveland was one of the five main refining centers in the U.S. besides Pittsburgh, New York City, Philadelphia, and the region northwestern Pennsylvania where most of the oil originated. By 1869, there was three times more kerosene refining capacity than needed to supply the market, and capacity remained in excess for many years. In June 1870, Flagler and Rockefeller formed Standard Oil of Ohio, which rapidly became the most profitable oil refiner in Ohio, and became one of the largest shippers of oil and kerosene in the country. Standard Oil grew by basically buying their competitors uh, that undercut competition, uh, do whatever they needed to do, basically, to, uh, you know, make the competitors eventually sell their business, make them realize it's more profitable to sell and stay in business. Uh, basically, they made J.R. Ewing seem like a nice guy. Standard Oil gradually gained almost complete and total control of oil refining and marketing in the United States through horizontal integration. In the kerosene industry, Standard Oil replaced the old distribution system with its own vertical system. It supplied kerosene by tank cars that brought the fuel to local markets and tank wagons and delivered to retail customers thus bypassing the existing network of wholesale jobbers. Despite improving the quality and availability of kerosene products while greatly reducing their costs to the public, the price of kerosene dropped almost 80% over the life of the company. Standard Oil's business practices created intense controversy. Uh, their most potent weapons were underselling, differential pricing, and secret transportation rebates. By 1880, according to the New York World newspaper, Standard Oil was, quote, the most cruel, impudent, pitiless, and grasping monopoly that ever fastened upon a country, unquote. Uh, Rockefeller and Flagler replied to the critics, In a business so large as ours, some things are likely to be done which we cannot approve. We correct them as soon as they come to our knowledge. In an interview later in life, Rockefeller said that Flagler was the financial brains behind the business that Standard Oil would not have become as successful as it did without Henry Flagler's knowledge. Anyhow, so Flagler had a heap of money. His first wife had an illness, I think it was tuberculosis, uh, but his, her doctor suggested that they go to Florida for the winter to escape the brutal conditions in, in the north. Uh, that was the first time Flagler experienced the warm, sunny atmosphere of Florida. Two years after his first wife died in 1881, he married again. 
uh, to one of his wife's caregivers. After the wedding couple traveled to St. Augustine, Flagler found the city charming. It was the oldest settlement in the continental U.S., oldest European settlement in the continental U.S., but hotel facilities and transportation systems were inadequate. Flagler remained on the board of directors of Standard Oil, but he gave up his day-to-day -day involvement in the corporation to pursue interests in Florida. He returned to St. Augustine in 1885 and made Smith an offer, Franklin W. Smith, who had just finished building the Villa Zoroidia Hotel. And Flagler offered to buy it, but Smith would not sell. Anyhow, F Flagler made Smith an offer. Smith could raise 50000 Flagler would invest 150000 and they would build a hotel together. Perhaps, fortunately for Smith, he couldn't come up with funds, so Fagler began construction of the 540-room Ponce de Leon Hotel by himself, but spent several times his original estimate. Smith helped train the Masons on the mixing and pouring techniques he used on Zareda. Fagler realized that there was need for sound transportation to support the hotels. He purchased short line railroads and that would later become the Florida East Coast Railway. Ponce, the Ponce de Leon Hotel is now part of Flagler College. He, invented, he invested with the guidance of Dr. Andrew Anderson, a native of St. Augustine. After many years of work, uh, the Ponce de Leon Hotel opened on January 10, 1888, and was an instant success. This really got Flagler's interest in creating a new American Riviera. After two years, he expanded his Florida holdings. He built a railroad bridge across the St. John's River at Jacksonville to gain access to the southern half of the state and purchased the Hotel Ormond just north of Daytona. He also, bit, also built the Alcazar Hotel as an overflow hotel for the Ponce de Leon. The Alcazar today is the Leitner Museum next to the Casa Monica Hotel in St. Augustine that Flagler bought from Franklin W. Smith. Flagler continued pushing south along the east coast of Florida. He completed a 1,100-room Royal Ponciana Hotel on the shores of Lake Worth and Palm Beach and extended his railroad to service the town, West Palm Beach, by 1894. He founded Palm Beach and West Palm Beach. The Royal Ponsonea Hotel was at the time the largest wooden structure in the world. Two years later, Flagler built the Palm Beach Inn, which, because people, guests would come and say we want to stay by the Breakers, ended up being renamed the Breakers in 1901. It overlooked the Atlantic Ocean in Palm Beach. Flagler originally intended West Palm Beach to be the terminus of his railroad, but in 1894 and 1895, severe freezes hit the area, causing Flagler to reconsider. Sixty miles to the south, the area that's known today as Miami was reportedly unharmed by the freeze. To further convince Flagler to continue the railroad to Miami, he was offered land in exchange for laying tracks from the private landowners, the Florida East Coast Canal and Transportation Company, and the Boston and Florida Atlantic Coastline Company. The landowners were Julia Tuttle, whom he had met in Cleveland, Ohio, and William Bricknell, who ran a trading post on Miami River.
By 1896, the 40s Coast Railway reached Biscayne Bay. Flagler dredged a channel, built streets, instituted the first water and power systems, and financed the city's first newspaper, the Metropolis. When the city incorporated in 1896, the citizens wanted to honor the man responsible for its growth by naming it Flagler. He declined the honor, persuading them to use an old Indian name, Mayamia. Instead, an artificial island was constructed in Biscayne Bay called Flagler Monument Island. In 1897, Flagler opened the exclusive Royal Palm Hotel on the north bank of the Miami River where it overlooked Biscayne Bay. He became known as the father of Miami, Florida. Looking at it historically, Flagler built his tourist empire and northern Florida by, ex by exploiting two brutal labor systems that blanketed the South for 50 years after the Civil War, convict leasing and debt, per and debt peonage. Created to preserve the white supremacist racial order and to address the South's labor shortages, these systems targeted African Americans, stealing their labor and entrapping them in state-sanctioned forms of, of involuntary servitude. Some 4,000 workers, including many as young as 15, became slaves in all but name. When an investigative journalist and the U.S. Justice Department uncovered the practices, Flagler and his allies successfully mobilized to whitewash the findings in Congress and white-owned Florida newspapers, some directly controlled by Flagler himself. Flagler's second wife was declared insane by Flagler's friend Dr. Anderson in 1896 and was institutionalized on and off starting that year. At the same time, he began to have an affair with Mary Lily Keenan, and by 1899, newspapers began to openly question whether the two were having an affair. That year, he reportedly gave her more than $1 million in jewelry. In 1901, Flagler bribed the Florida legislature and governor to pass a law that made and curb insanity grounds for divorce, opening way for Flagler to remarry. Flagler was the only person to be divorced under the law before it was repealed in 1905. A spouse's mental incapacity was then restored by legislature's grounds for dissolution of marriage and remains the law of Florida today. On August 4, 24, 1901, Ten days after his divorce, Flagler married Millie Lil Mary Lilly at her family's plantation, Liberty Hall, and the couple soon moved into their new Palm Beach estate, Whitehall, a 55-room Beau Arts home designed by the New York-based firm of Carrere and Hastings, which had also designed the New York Public Library and the Pan American Exposition. Built in 1902 as a wedding present to Mary Lilly, Whitehall, now the Flagler Museum, was a 60,000 square foot winter retreat that established the Palm Beach season of about 8 to 12 weeks for the wealthy of America's gilded age. By 1905, Flagler decided that his Florida East Coast Railway should be extended from Biscayne Bay to Key West some 128 miles past the end of Flor the Florida Peninsula. At the time, Key West was Florida's most populous city, with a population of about 20,000, and was also the United States deep water port closest to the canal that the U.S. government would propose to build in Panama. Flagler wanted to take advantage of additional trade with Cuba and Latin America, as well as the increased trade with the West that the Panama Canal would bring. The Florida Overseas Railroad, also known as the Kia West Extension, 
was completed in 1912. Over 30 years, Flagler had invested about $50 million in railroad, home, and hotel construction and had made donations to suffering farmers after the freeze in 1894. When asked by the president of Rollins College in Winter Park about his philanthropic efforts, Flagler reported replied, I believe this state is the easiest place for many men to gain a living. I do not believe anyone else would develop it if I did not do it. But I do hope to live long enough to prove that I am a good businessman by getting a dividend on my investment. In March 1913, Flagler fell down a flight of marble stairs at Whitehall. He never recovered and died in Palm Beach of his industry injuries on May 20th, 1913, 83 years old. At 3 p.m. on the day of the funeral, May 23rd, 1913, every engine on the Florida East Coast Railway stopped wherever it was for 10 minutes as tribute to Flagler. It was reported that people along the railway line waited all night for the passing of the funeral train as it traveled from Palm Beach to St. Augustine. So, now we know why Henry Flagler has so many places in Florida, especially along the East Coast, named after him. The Florida East Coast Railway Key West Extension, also known as Flagler's Folly, survived until eight until nineteen thirty five, I believe, when the Labor Day hurricane basically destroyed it. But much of the right of way you can travel today if you take Route 1 from Miami down to Key West. The bridges that you're traveling on through the Keys are basically the old railroad right, right of way. And it was one of the largest construction projects ever undertaken by an individual definitely in Florida's history and probably in the history of the United States. Uh, you know, you can say what you want about Flagler using convict labor and you know, those things which we look at nowadays as being bad. And I'm not saying they were ever good, but as has been said of so many people, he was a man of his time. That was the situation. Uh, that was available as time he took advantage of it. Um, I don't know that anyone, that anyone else would do any different. Anyhow, that concludes this episode of Southern Byways. Thank you all for stopping by. Please like this episode. Please Subscribe to this channel. It'll help improve our YouTube metrics. And we'll see you at the next one. Have a great day, everyone.